Welcome back to Fresh Outlook. I'm Logan Crawford. Uh, Alex Spiris, the new leader of the coalition of the radical left, is the focus of attention in Europe after his party's victory in the recent election. Spiris had vowed to bring change to a country devastated by an economic crisis and strict austerity measures. Take a look. He shrunk the cabinet from 20 to 10, but Greece's debt may not be so easy to reduce. The lineup is dominated by left wing academics, and only one minister has any previous experience of government. Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras sees the transformation as a positive. He wants to show Greeks they'll get the change they voted for. We did not come here to take over institutions and to enjoy the trappings of power. We have come to radically change the way in which politics and governance is carried out in this country. But the challenges are daunting and Greek markets continue to be battered. Three days after the election, short-term borrowing costs topped 17 percent. Even longer-term ones were above 10 percent. Athens Stock Exchange also fell another 7 percent, with bank shares down 22 percent. Other major fallers included the Piraeus Port Authority, after ministers halted plans to sell off state assets. Investors are finding it hard to see how Syriza's electoral promises to abandon austerity can be achieved while carrying through agreed fiscal and structural reforms. No chance of Greece's new finance minister underestimating the task he has ahead, and friction with EU partners may not stop with economics. Greece also appeared to distance itself from an EU call to consider broader sanctions against Russia. Later said they hadn't signed the sanctions statement because they hadn't been consulted. Either way, it suggests a long haul ahead, even with talk from the finance minister of a new relationship of trust and honesty between Greece and its European partners. We are back live on set now here at Fresh Outlook. I am joined by the Ebru think tank, Dr. Cornelia Sakadiru, prof uh, professor of political philosophy at LaSalle University, Matthew Tiermond, an, uh, um, an economist with a focus on Central and Eastern Europe, and Sebastian Olich, an international lawyer and consultant. And Cornelia, I will begin with you. What does this mean for Greece, Europe, and the world that we have a new prime minister in Greece who do, does have these left leanings, who does want to put an end to austerity measures? Well, for Europe, it means a challenge to the austerity uh, policies that have been followed so far, uh, with implications on other European countries like uh, Spain, where there is a movement against austerity, and Italy as well and less vocal also opponents of austerity like uh, President Francois Hollande of France who when he campaigned in 2012 uh, promised to rid Europe and France of austerity. So the election of Tsipras and Syriza itself is not as radical as it appears to be. I mean their, uh, their agenda in this area resonates with many Europeans of the left but also of the right, because you have to remember that uh, Marine Le Pen, the leader of the National Front in France, is also very critical of austerity. For Greece, of course, it means a very difficult period, but certainly one that uh, uh, takes into account the fact that in the last five years, the standard of living in the country has declined by 30 percent, has dropped by 30 percent. Right now, you have 1.5 uh, million unemployed and about two million people, if not more, below the poverty level. This is unprecedented. If you think that in 2008, before the austerity measures began and the crisis, Greece had an unemployment rate of 8 percent. Right now, it stands at about 27 percent, double that among youth. So these are devastating numbers. Matthew, most of the people in Greece work for the government, according to my understanding. So the government is part of the problem and can be part of the solution. What is your take on what's happening there now? Uh, well, first, uh, my view is that in the short term, I don't think you're going to see major, major uh, structural impediments to, uh, to keeping the, the European monetary uh, unit uh, intact. I think it is a little bit of a canary in a coal mine moment that you have a new party rising so quickly and getting a mandate from the people that is certainly economically Eurosceptic, not just socially. We see socially all over Europe, but now you're seeing the people saying, we did not sign on to, bird, to take on this debt burden on our backs at, uh, in perpetuity. Uh, I tend to think that right now Tsipras has this mandate and he's going to use this for maximum leverage to make this easier 
on the Greek people. Obviously, there's a, uh, a major blowback against austerity. And what you're seeing is that he knows that Germany does not want to recognize a major debt write down. They, they see the risk of contagion if they do. So they're going to, they will be willing to extend a little bit more room breathing room for Greece with their debts. And you're seeing that this morning, uh, where yesterday uh, Merkel said we wouldn't be uh, doing any restructuring of any sort, and now already they're talking about a $20 billion uh, short-term extension so that Greece can pay its upcoming debt payments in February, March, and April. So I think you're going to see uh, Cyprus use some leverage to give the Greek people some breathing room. But eventually this is going to be recurring. I mean, they have uh, 200 and uh, they've got $317 billion in debt. They've just had a $254 billion restructure. $20 billion, okay. They'll throw that onto, uh, onto this debt burden, you know, solve the debt crisis with more debt. But eventually they're gonna, it's going to come to a, a tipping point where they say we can't keep doing $20 billion every quarter. Sebastian, what are your thoughts? Well, this is definitely a very interesting situation. I actually look at Cyprus and I, I'm not really fascinated by this person. I'm not fascinated by his coming to power. I think that's a measure that the Greeks are really very desperate. They have tried Papandreou, they, they have tried Samaras, they have nobody else to try. So there comes a very young, inexperienced, untested, unfiltered leader who promises pretty much everything he's going to solve the crisis, and they trust him. And, I, and we have to understand that because, they, like the like, uh, doctor said, they have went through so much. They have really been impoverished, and these austerity measures that were put on Greece they just didn't work. And when you look at it, there were some good parts in it and some very bad parts in it. You have that good part, which is cutting down the government spending, shrinking the size of the government, making the government more limited. And there was this other uh, part of this austerity measure, which sort of put down the whole economy down. Th that, that's they increased the taxes to the point that, that they started to shrink it the private sector. So somebody who is making $55,000 in Greece pays right now 42% of income tax. That's almost half. And on top of that, you are going to have social security tax, you are going to have uh, health insurance. So $55,000, we take more than half of that to give to the government to pay the debts. Right. So obviously, everybody is desperate, is frustrated. And when you take so much money from the private sector, you are making it almost impossible to reinvest it to start up the economy. Well, this is why it's said that socialism doesn't work because after a while you run out of other people's money. Is that what's happening in Greece, Cornelia? We've run out of other people's money? I think what's happening in Greece in part, and here, you know, like, there are two sides to this, right? There's the side of, for instance, uh, German finance minister Wolfgang Schäuble, who said that the problem is not really the austerity measures. The problem in Greece is that the structural reforms that accompanied the uh, austerity measures and to which the Greek government was of Prime Minister Samaras was committed never took place. And so the, the challenge for the new administration, for the new government, is to do, to implement the structural reforms. These have to be done no matter what. Uh, a country that has the red tape that Greece has uh, is a very difficult place for investors, domestic and foreign, to come. A country that has an overblown uh, uh, public sector uh, that is basically the recipient of political favoritism and so on, that also is not going to work. So you, you need fundamental changes. A country that has closed professions, like uh, pharmacists, for instance, are a closed profession. Uh, taxi drivers, the same thing. These have to open. Uh, land registry, you know, that has to go. I mean, that, that has to, to go into effect. So there are aspects of the, you know, the function of the Greek state that are not working right. And these have to be fixed. So in part, the Europeans are right when they say that the fault lies with the Greeks. But at the same time, uh, there was no discriminating, you know, approach to austerity in Greece. Is it the fault of the Europeans? In part, yes. Is it the fault of the Greek governments? Yes. Of the corrupt political elites? Yes. Of the Greek oligarchs? Yes. Uh, so, so there's a lot of blame to go around. Because in this you talk situation. about privatization, for instance, right? Like the port of Piraeus. Uh, the, the Greek finance minister pointed this out in his BBC interview that some of these privatizations, you know, uh, were done uh, under a deflationary uh, period, and so these were given to. Uh, investors, you know, for, for peanuts, as he said. So again, these are issues that obviously concern the Greek government, and rightly so. Now, Mr. Tsipras happens to be inexperienced. Yes, he is. Uh, 
But uh, let me say something also, that many of the Greek uh, politicians who enter into politics because of family connections are also equally inexperienced. Uh, is there You've a concern? You've got a couple but, in this country, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you, you see, it's not, uh, it's a complex issue. But uh, for the Greek public, it's certainly a time of hope, as they promised, and also a sense of pride. And I think that should be taken into account as well, the psychological factor. Matthew, talking about the psychological factor, Cyprus did a couple of different things during his swearing in. He didn't wear a necktie, <laughs> and he didn't put his hand on a Bible. Yeah. What do you make of those uh, signals? Well, he's certainly uh, not a member of the status quo. He is an outsider. He's even formed a coalition with the far-right nationalists, this independent Greeks, which was kind of unexpected. They thought he would stick with other leftist coalitions. But the problem is with so many of the these incumbent groups, they are truly incumbent. They've been there for generations. I mean, you look at uh, Papandreou, who's a third generation uh, prime minister, or sort of uh, higher up political authority in Greece. There's been an institutionalized patronage system that has formalized the mechanization of graft into a political class. And this is something that even the Greek people have not been, they liked it when they got tax immunity, but when the bill came in the last three, four years, they were not as, uh, not as uh, happy to be a part of the system and willing to reject it. And this, uh, this vote for this uh, new party that formed 10 years ago, I think is very bullish. It's uh, the Greek people saying, we're not going to be a part of this system where we don't get a say. We have the oldest uh, democracy in Europe, and it, in theory, is a representative democracy, but in recent history, it has not been. And this is their way of reaffirming their sovereignty. I think it's a start of something you're going to see all over Europe, in Spain, in Portugal, and Italy. And because the EU and the Troika have imposed very, very, very tough, uh, tough uh, standards on a people that did not want this. They did not make most of these corrupt choices that the government made for them. Interesting point, but I would say this, Sebastian, as an outsider, potentially an investor in the country, I'm going to steer clear of Greece because it seems like they're going to default. It's very probable that they're going to default. Nobody wants uh, that to happen. But look at this. They, they have 11 million people in Greece, and their current debt is like 480 billion. 320. And uh, the, the interest, the only interest they pay annually is like $30 billion, something like that, you know, close. There's no way they're going to pay it back. There's no way, I mean, it's physically impossible. Now you have also the creditors, the big countries like, you know, Germany and France, and they also, the politicians over there have to answer to their own voters. And they look at it from the position of a creditor. I give you the money, I want the money back. Right. So, uh, I mean, for Tsipras, it's a very dangerous and difficult situation. Unless it plays out like Iceland, where they default on the debt and they just kind of rebuild from the bottom up on their own. I'm going to have to hold you there. A lot to talk about. Uh, the Greek people are fine people and ancient people who have uh, contributed greatly to our own American structure of government, so we wish them well. And I want to thank our guests, Cornelia, Matthew, and Sebastian, for joining us here today. When we come back, are you ready for some wings, beer, commercials? And oh, yeah, are you ready for some football? After this.